have your attention if we could. I want to thank you all for being here. On behalf of the Richmond Center, a joint venture of Columbia Law School and Columbia Business School, thank you for, being, for joining us tonight. I'm Jesse Green, Senior Fellow at the Richmond Center. Uh, the Richmond Center promotes evidence-based public policy and fosters dialogue and debate on emerging policy questions where business and markets intersect with the law. This evening's topic is at the head of this intersection. It is about the macro picture for the future of the United States. Where is U.S. economic leadership headed? We have just completed five years of recovery from a near miss to an economic collapse. Much progress has been made, but what are the long-term prospects and risks? What should we be doing? And most of all, what should our government leaders be doing? To give us more insight into this complex issue, we have two leading economic experts with us tonight. Glenn Hubbard is the dean of our Columbia Business School and author of the book Balance, which explores the economics of great powers. He is also the author of over 100 articles on economic and finance topics. He was the chairman of the U.S. Econo Council of Economic Advisors and now serves on other leadership committees. We look forward to his views on the important economic question we have posed tonight. Exploring these issues with Glenn tonight is Edmund Phelps, 2006 Nobel Laureate in Economics and Director of the Center on Capitalism and Society here at Columbia. His new book, Mass Flourishing, synthesizes his research into a sweeping economic history and a defense of the modern values underlying economic dynamics. There are numerous other achievements in Professor Phelps's background that will benefit, benefit this discussion tonight. <coughs> we thank both of them for being here with us. Well, let's get to it. Glenn, maybe you can open with uh, giving us your views uh, and insights from your book and from your research. Well, thanks, thanks very much, Jesse. Thanks, everybody, for, for coming out tonight. Uh, I would say that um, if you're going to read a book in this area, I'm really going to commend to you Ned's book. Um, over mine. I, I prefer that you buy mine, but, the, you know, but in, in the re Mass Flourishing, seriously, the, Ned's most recent book is just a phenomenal treatise on what it takes uh, to get growth, and it comes from decades of research in which Ned has been engaged, and I commend it to you uh, as, well as, uh, as well as my own. Uh, I'm not going to have a whole lot to say in general remarks on what necessarily could make the country grow faster, but I will tell you what could make the country grow slower and what I'm, what I'm very worried about. Uh, and I did write this book with Tim Kaine uh, called Balance. It was really about uh, why great powers stumble. And I got into this for a couple of reasons. One, I got into economics uh, as an engineer. It was my undergraduate training because I was really interested in questions that I didn't feel like I knew the answer to. Like, why isn't the whole world rich? Sounds like a simple question. Uh, I would argue there's some pretty pointed answers to it, but it's, it's an important one. And what would it really take to bring prosperity to a large fraction of a given country? Those are the questions that brought me to, um, to uh, economics. Now, what's interesting about the current debate, I think, over the pace of growth is that in some sense, we, all of us, but even we, our profession, are kind of looking in the wrong places. We're, we're almost looking only for technical answers. I mean, how many times have you heard, if only if this or that wise man or this or that great economist could come work on this, we'd fix it. I'm gonna submit to you my remarks. It's more complicated uh, than that and has much more to do with politics and political economy than it does narrowly um, with economics. And just to, to take a, um, a global perspective um, with you, if, if we were standing or sitting together, let's say 100 years ago, so we're uh, you know, about on the eve of World War I, and we looked at the per capita income in the industrial world, it would have been about $3,000 in today's money. So that, that shows you the enormous growth in living standards since then. <coughs> Uh, and in fact, if you were lucky enough to be an American, that number was about $1,000 higher. So the United States was already considerably more prosperous. If I were to turn the clock back to the year 1000, that $3,000 or $4,000 number, again, just keeping in today's money to compare apples to apples, would have been about $400. So again, growth in that period. 
But here's a mystery for you. If I turn the clock way back, if I turned it back to the time of Caesar Augustus uh, and the Pax Romana period in Rome, living standards were actually higher uh, in the core of the Roman Empire at that time than they were about a thousand years afterward. Now this is an incredibly important question for economists and for stumbling of great powers because we like to think about explaining growth and what starts growth, and our profession has lots of good answers to that involving institutions, but I think we also have to talk about why growth stops. Now about 25 years ago, a very famous historian, Paul Kennedy, waved it into these waters by saying his answer was about overstretch. So he took Rome, the example I just gave you, and said Rome overspent on its military. It tried to defend too large a territory. Uh, he talked about the British uh, Empire uh, as also being an, an example of an overspending great power. And then the cautionary tale he tried to tell 25 years ago was about the United States, that the United States was about to stumble as a great power because it spent too much money on the military. Now, I don't agree with Paul Kennedy, but um, I can explain to you why by just turning to his cover of his book. So we don't have to go through the whole book. Let's just focus on the cover. So the cover is a globe, and it's stairs going up or down. And having fallen down the <coughs> stairs with his face already hitting the floor is John Bull, the symbol of Britain. Stumbling a little bit is Uncle Sam, this nation's symbol. And who do you suppose is alighting the stairs, eyes, heavenward, with the imagery of the book's cover focusing on him? China. No, 25 years ago, oh, Japan. Japan. It was a Japanese salaryman. Many economists reviewing the book, including myself many years ago, suggested that this was a bit of a problem that it would be unlikely for Japan to continue to have the growth experience that it had had because it really didn't have the institutions that supported very long-term growth. Economists, going back to Smith's time, you know, have talked about the wealth of nations, and leaders in politics are often confused by where wealth comes from. You know, in, in economics, we, we like to think about uh, three S economists in this regard. One is Smith, that it's about specialization and the size of your economy. Or another would be about solo and forward-looking uh, investment. And another about Schumpeter and the, the ideas and, and the innovation frontier uh, in an economy. And in fact, many mistakes of great powers have been because leaders don't understand this point. The book Balance, I want to come mainly to talk about the US, but I will mention some case studies we do in the book. Um, Tim and I argue that Rome's collapse had more to do with understretch than it did overstretch. Uh, it had to do with a period of looking inward, uh, banning immigration and building walls, debasing the currency. Do any of these headlines sound familiar? They're not just 2,000 years ago. That, that Rome really had taken an outward orientation and flipped it on the inside and was rotting from within long before it actually fell um, militarily. If you're interested, there's just some analysis in the book about how much Rome was really spending. It wasn't really overspending. Uh, on, the, on the military. Some of the other cases we look at of great powers stumbling because of politics not keeping up with economics are Ming era China, where the, the famous voyages of Cheng Ho, in the transliteration of, of my day, or as a student, or Zheng Ha, I guess today, were the great opening of China uh, in that period, where China became the commercial envy of the world, and then growth just stopped. I mean, if you looked at iron uh, output and indications of economic activity that we have for the time, you have a virtual cessation of growth having very little to do with forgetting how to build ships and having a lot to do with a court struggle uh, for the emperor's soul between one group that was advantaged, new commercial merchant classes, versus court uh, officials uh, and imperial tutors that were disadvantaged Again, a political system struggling, not about economics. Imperial Spain is a great example of this. You know, it's, people often think the expression, the sun never sets, is about the British Empire. It was actually said about Spain. Spain was the empire of all <coughs> empires. And Spain's empire had a problem in that Spanish monarchs, a series of Spanish monarchs, actually thought wealth was about gold and silver uh, and not about the productive frontier and a large number of economic uh, policy mistakes, fiscal policy mistakes 
uh, were there. In Britain, which would seem to be the archetype of Kennedy's case, because Britain did exhaust itself uh, with two world wars, uh, Tim and I argue there's much more to the story. Britain was insufficiently British. Going back to Adam Smith uh, and William Pitt the Elder, there were arguments that Britain's uh, struggle with the United States uh, should have not have happened, that Britain should have extended the rights of British citizenship uh, much further in the empire. Britain practiced liberal, classic liberal policies at home, but that's not what it was doing uh, in the British Empire. A few other case studies we look at were the Ottoman Empire, where um, an early administrative success in what were called Janissary Corps, uh, essentially slave corps that ran the empire, turned from being actually uh, a big source of productivity for the empire to rent seeking and then stopping technological uh, advance in the empire. Uh, we talk about the Eurozone's uh, current problems, um, Japan's struggles. Again, I'll mention some of these. We can come back to them later if you like. Uh, and a discussion of the state of California. Now, I'm a New Yorker, so I'm allowed to call California a foreign country. I'll put it with the others. California is interesting for this purpose because it is the only major landmass in the world that shares the wonderful um, climate of the Mediterranean uh, that's not in the Mediterranean. Uh, it, however, shares something else uh, with the Mediterranean, which is an incredibly dysfunctional political system. So California is a great example of a really rich state that has at several points, including most recently, put itself almost at the risk of not growing simply because its politics couldn't keep up with the economics. Now, what does all this have to do with the United States um, today? And here again, what I want to talk about a little bit is what might limit growth. And, and one big factor in this, I think, is the uh, massive uh, buildup of debt. Uh, in the United States. We have seen an enormous increase uh, in the debt to GDP ratio uh, in, in recent decades. Um, and we didn't just go around fighting wars, and this is not where the debt came from, I'll say more about that in a minute, but we've had uh, a buildup that is now so high that it threatens growth. And I say that not because there's some magical number that if the debt to GDP only crossed X, the economy's in trouble, I'm saying um, something uh, actually more mundane, that high levels of debt imply necessarily one or both of higher future taxes, which themselves <coughs> could depress innovation and growth, or cutting spending on most of what the public um, thinks government does. Now let me make this flesh and blood for you. If I were to ask you to think in your mind's eye with me historically, what does the federal debt to GDP ratio look like? If I were to trace an arc from the American Revolution to about 1970, what do you suppose that picture looks like? Not the numbers, just the shape. So I've got the American Revolution, 1970. Plot the debt to GDP ratio. I assume it would be fairly flat, a peak during Civil War, World War I, World War II. You're exactly right. The entire, and, and I could have filled in another industrial country, the story of debt was a story of war and peace. So countries borrowed money to fight a war, socializing the cost of the war over multiple generations. Uh, and then when peacetime happened, spending went down, we're stopping killing people, the economy grows, so both the numerator and the denominator kick in to lower the debt to GDP ratio. Just to illustrate this for you, at the end of World War II, America's debt to GDP ratio was a little over 100%, about 102%. By 1960, it was only 40%. That's how it was supposed to work. Now, something changed. So after 1970, if I think about industrial countries, and we use the US, but again, I could be plugging in others, what's going on? Now, now walk through the picture. I mean, in the Kennedy thesis, again, I should still be thinking about war in the military, right? And that was the story prior to 1970. What, what's going on with debt to GDP? Where, where's it coming from? What does the picture look like after 1970? Well, great society and huge increase in social <coughs> welfare yeah. costs. Yeah, exactly. The, the change is not about war. In fact, if you looked at military spending, the nation has spent less as a percentage of GDP on the military consistently as we're marching forward. The absolute dollars in the defense budget are very large as a fraction of GDP continues to fall. And indeed, 
the debate in Washington over people who care a lot about defense is whether the defense budget should be maybe 3% of American GDP or 4% of American <coughs> GDP. I'm not saying that 1% of American GDP is chump change, but it is a small fraction of the real issue, which has been the, ex the explosion in Social Security, uh, Medicare, uh, and, and Medicaid uh, spending. Now, this is a problem because, it, again, people are looking at this as, as if we needed to look at the economics. So maybe we need to get some economists to figure this out. Well, nothing I've said to you is rocket science. Um, indeed, if you were to look at the cover of the Congressional Budget Office's long-term outlook, and I can tell by looking at you, you all have it bookmarked, and you can probably <laughs> pull it up on your smartphone. You don't have to read the report, much like Kennedy's book, just look at the cover. The cover has a picture of um, taxes to GDP rising slowly over time. I think real bracket creep, we're growing, people more affluent, pay more taxes, and spending is just going off uh, to the ozone. And that is really a story about uh, entitlements. Now, the problem with this, I would argue, is that rather than thinking about this purely as economics, we have to think about it in more political economy terms. And just to tee up a conversation, I would put three things on the table. One would be um, the classic economist joke. Uh, the second would be the game of basketball. And the third is the odyssey. So the classic economist joke. Now, it pains me to tell this because Ned and I are classic economists. And the classic economist joke you've all heard, or if not, I can add this to yet another reason you can laugh at your econ professor, is something like this, that you know, there's an economist and a chemist and a physicist marooned on a desert island. And a can of soup or stew washes ashore. And the physicist says, uh, let's uh, bang it open, and we'll eat it. The chemist says, no, 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 too messy. We're going to heat it. It'll pop open, and then it'll be warm. And of course, the economist famously says, we're safe. They don't know this joke. So <laughs> the economist famously says, let's assume a can open. Now the problem is, with purely economic analysis of these existential problems of great powers, it's like assuming a good government. Right? So I'm assuming that politics are fine. All I need to do is find a smart person. There are lots of smart people on both sides of the aisle. That's not the problem. The problem, I would submit, has more to do with an example I'm going to give you from basketball. <coughs> so it turns out basketball nearly died as a competitive uh, sport uh, in the 1930s, 1940s. And the reason for that was what was called in the day uh, the tall man problem. And so the way the tall man problem worked was when you didn't have a shot clock and you didn't have a three-point shot, if my team had the tallest guys, we just hung around the hoop and dominated play. Now, that's great if you happen to be the team with the tall guys. It's not that exciting to watch, as it turns out. And so enter a man named Howard Hobson. Now, I came across Howard Hobson because he actually was a basketball coach uh, for the University of Oregon who wrote a PhD thesis at Columbia. So that was an era when the basketball coach got a PhD from an Ivy League university. So it's a different, different time period. So Howard Hobson's big idea was the three-point shot, to make a long story short. Um, he writes that as his PhD dissertation. It uh, uh, starts in a special game between Columbia and Fordham, which uh, Columbia wins. It gets practiced a little bit in college ball, eventually adopted, then into pro ball, makes the career of, of Michael Jordan. Now, why do I mention Howard Hobson to you? Sometimes when you have a problem that you can't treat as technical, uh, you actually have to change the rules. Basketball would have gone off the track without changing the rules. <clears throat> How to do that, I think this, the, um, one of my favorite stories in the Odyssey uh, offers the way. I love the story of the sirens because it's a story about leadership. It's a story about temptation. It's a story about accomplishment. And our leader, of course, is going past the sirens whose song is so enchanting, everybody wants to hear. But of course, what happens when you hear the sirens' music? Yeah, yeah it's, it's not a pleasant end. And so what does our leader do? How does our leader approach this? So the men put wax, or are forced to put wax in their ears so that they can do the hard work of rowing the boat. What about our leader? Tied to the mast. Tied to the mast. Now, what does that mean here? 
It could mean a lot of things if debt is the particular area in which politics doesn't keep up with economics. A simple light form of rope might be um, treating the obligations of entitlement programs much as businesses are forced to treat pension and health care. So in other words, every year, if, we, if actuaries tell us there's a change in accrued liabilities of X in these programs, the Congress will be told you have to raise taxes to pay for that, cut some other program, or cut these <coughs> programs, that the American people aren't going to be on autopilot for this. A more binding rope uh, would be an actual spending limitation. Now, most economists, myself included, Ed can speak for himself, have been skeptical of politicians' versions of balanced budget amendments because they would exacerbate business cycles. It is possible to develop a long-term spending limit. So you could say spending has a cap that cannot be exceeded by a moving average, let's say, of seven years inflation-adjusted revenue. I picked seven because it's a number from Pharaoh's dream, and I like stories. But if you like six or eight, that's fine with me. And I pick inflation adjusted, so I'm not confusing nominal and real. But it's possible to set this and then tell the Congress, you can make any exception you want. You don't even have to lie to us that it's a flood. It's just that each time you make an exception, there's an escalating supermajority until the rope gets so tight they can't move. Now, just to close out what Tim and I find in the book, I'm actually pretty optimi optimistic that we're going to get around this. Uh, there are a couple of reasons why. Both Sweden and Canada, uh, within the past 20 or so years, have faced major, major fiscal changes, changes that almost took them to the precipice, but there was reform. And I don't mean reform just in terms of playing with budget <coughs> numbers. I mean reform of institutions of the budget and I think we are certainly uh, capable of that. I also think we're seeing a lot more competition for political ideas in the United States, uh, and that is, uh, and that is uh, surely, uh, surely all to the good. I just close by just leaving you with a story. Um, several months ago, one of my older son had uh, turned 21, and as we were having a celebration for him, my mind turned to numbers, which is, just shows how boring I am at birthday parties and other things. And so I was thinking that if he were to experience the same growth trajectory between his age and mine, which is, let's just say, somewhat north of 21, but over that period, if he experienced the same growth trajectory, he and his friends would have about double the income of people today at the time he reaches my age. So when he and his friends are trying to decide about defense and the environment and a whole variety of public goods, they're going to be able to have a much better choice set than Ned and I have sitting here today. But that's not manna from heaven. And we've, we can do a lot to discourage growth, hoping we can tease Ned out on his work on how we can encourage it too, but it's not, it's not guaranteed in stone. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Brian. Ned, what's your, what are your thoughts here? Um, okay. Hey, um, well, that was fascinating. First of all, let me say, Glenn, that I think your book has every bit as much knowledge as mine has, so um, we have different emphases. Uh, <clears throat> I just want them to buy mine and read yours. I think decline and fall is a tremendously important uh, subject uh, today for the West because uh, we're seeing a whole lot of decline in the West. And um, in my view, it's been going on in Europe since the 1950s, basically. But they were, they could always bail themselves out by copying the, the innovations uh, coming out in America. So they still managed to have productivity rising at a pretty good clip. Uh, <clears throat> but when uh, growth slowed down, in uh, productivity growth. When productivity growth slowed down in the United States towards the end of the 60s and in the early 1970, that was the handwriting on the wall for Europe. They weren't, weren't going to be able to play this innovation uh, transfer game uh, forever. And you see that very clearly in the data. By the end of the uh, 1990s, productivity has, has ground to a halt in France and Italy. And it, it, and it did that in, in uh, Germany 
not very many years uh, later. Uh, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I think what's interesting about uh, the book by uh, Glenn is that uh, it, it's it's uh, emphatic theme that uh, the the declines are always the uh, result of some endogenous causes. They're not the result of of adverse exogenous shocks. In every case, the country uh, in question messed up. Uh, <clears throat> And Glenn, uh, it, it's characteristic of, of Glenn's book that uh, he sees economic policy, bad economic policy, as at the center uh, of, of, of uh, the problems uh, that, that developed in every one of the uh, declining uh, countries over, over history. Uh, that's not, was not foreordained. Uh, you could have talked about institutions, maybe institutions got corrupted, the book by Asamoglu and, uh, and uh, the other guy? Uh, Robinson. Robinson uh, is uh, very heavy on uh, economic uh, institutions, though it also uh, touches on policy. And uh, I guess a characteristic of my book is that, is that there's a heavy emphasis on uh, what's happening to values and how that impacts on uh, the economic uh, culture. Yeah, um, so, um, Glenn, you give a lot of attention to budgetary deficits and uh, public debt in, in the United States, so let's, let's talk about that at first. Um, let me just say, um, by way of beginning a conversation, that um, I think that um, you put uh, almost exclusive emphasis upon uh, the rise of spending, in particular uh, social spending, welfare spending, uh, <clears throat> coupled with a failure to tax in order to pay for it. Uh, <clears throat> of course, that's always got to be an explanation, uh, that an imbalance between the spending and taxes. but. Um, in Dean Hubbard's thinking, it, it's primarily this explosion of uh, spending. Um, <clears throat> there are other stories you could tell. My book, uh, it's, it's not so important for my book. I'm not focused much on deficits and debts, but I, I do spend a few pages uh, arguing that when, when growth slowed down in the United States, and when productivity growth slowed down, <coughs> in the late 60s and 1970s, then uh, <clears throat> expenditure, expenditure, public expenditure kept on uh, chugging ahead because the, the, the business of politicians in this country is to do things for their constituents. And so they kept on thinking up new, new things for their constituents or responding to new demands uh, uh, of constituents, while income, relatively speaking, was dead in the water. And so hence tax revenues were uh, relatively uh, flat as well. So budgetary deficits just uh, arose on, on, on uh, that account. Um, so let me, uh, I'd like to ask a couple of questions, Glenn. How do you think we're going to solve this problem? Are we going to, are we going to raise taxes like grown-ups, or are we going to, uh, <laughs> or are we going to um, uh, bite the bullet and, and uh, heroically uh, cut back on Social Security or Medicare or, 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 or those things? Or, or I'm, I'm teasing you a little bit, but what are, what are we going to do? And and and. Uh, <clears throat> All right, and then I'll save my second question. For okay, later. well, I mean, I think you're, you're asking exactly the right question. You know, how, how did we get here? The, the problem is not just the high level of debt, but where it comes from and what this debt is doing. We essentially have a set of programs that are on autopilot. It's not as if the Congress every year is coming together and sort of deliberately voting 
large deficits. These are essentially off-budget programs. They, we are running a deficit on budget, but the far bigger deficit are these, are these off-budget changes. And we don't have a politics that forces accountability on Congress. Of, of course, if you tell politicians of either strike that they're allowed to do whatever they want, they, they will do just that. And so there, there is a question about, um, about rules. Part of my fear of having high debt levels is that they will crowd out other kinds of spending uh, before they lead to the very large tax increases that you're, you're interested in. So for example, it's not just military spending that's falling relative to GDP. In Washington, what goes under the genteel name of domestic discretionary spending means spending on all of you uh, in education. It means a variety of research spending. All of that is also falling substantially as a fraction of GDP. And we're getting to a point where if I go on the street and I ask Americans what they think government does, most of what they list will be tiny in the budget. And what is really in the budget is interest and um, entitlement spending. What should we do about it? To my mind, again, treating as a technical problem, which I think is the wrong way, but you asked me a technical question, I'll give you a technical answer. I, I, I think that we should slow the growth of these programs and turn them into true social insurance programs, which means they're very generous for the least well off among us, but not for all of you, who I think are going to do very, very well. We can, of course, raise taxes. In the book, we're, we're silent over which is the one to do. We're, we're a little bit about arithmetic more than in economics. The problem, though, with raising taxes by the amount that would be required to fund these promises, I would suspect you might bring innovation to a, a halt. So the, the question is, you know, what's the, what's the right mix? What we're about in the book is more how do you change the rules to force politicians to make these choices? Whether they choose a tax increase or spending cut, voters will decide, but just forcing the choice so that all of you don't wind up carrying the bill some years from now. And just to carry on to that a little bit, it seems to me Europe, with all of its problems, has to suffer a lot before they can make a change. Well, they are and suffering. They are, and they are. And they are, and they are. The, the question is for the United States, what suffering do we have to do before we can force this change? Right? We all, I think, all agree that something has to move give here. Either you've got to cut the expenditures or you've got to raise taxes, and it's something. But what's the pressure that is going to cause it? What is the pain level we have to go through? What is economically the crisis that's going to have to come to well, that's going to trigger this? This is what scares me, and I'd be very interested in Ned's view on this. I, I feel like um, a doctor whose patient is looking for um, heart attack and quick treatment when what I'm really treating is cancer, you know, or something that's a longer term mm -hmm. illness that isn't going to lead to the kind of immediate acute crisis to torture the health uh, analogy that would be an heart attack. And I fear that that's what we're looking at. I fear that the result is simply diminished growth opportunities. We're already seeing this in big declines in the employment population ratio. Many economists skeptical about the country's long-term growth prospects. And I, I think that's, that's what can happen. Uh, and that, unfortunately, is not likely to lead to riots in the streets today. I don't know what your view would be. Um. Yeah, I, I don't. Uh, I don't disagree with that. Um, so, Glenn, what's your feeling? That it, do you think that if we got a hold of this public debt problem, uh, let's say in your what may be your preferred way of, of getting a hold of the expenditure side, uh, do you think that would be it? Do you think would be then back to the races? We would have high prosperity and high growth again. No, do you think that that's the big thing that's that, that is already causing some decline and threatening more decline? Or, or is it a whole bunch of stuff, not all of which you've mentioned this it's, evening? It's a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. Uh, and if you, what, taking away the debt headwind is extremely important. I think it's necessary because it removes the crushing tax burden future argument. But we still are spending too little in basic research. We've seen a decline in startup and entrepreneurial uh, activity. We've seen uh, significant declines in the diffusion of some technologies. Those are things that are that have to be turned around. So it's not just about debt. Uh, it's about a general policy, uh, general policy agenda. I, for what it's worth, think that the country still can grow reasonably well. I, I'm not. I don't know if you're a Bob Gordonite on this. I, I don't think we're 
our future is a grim one of slow growth, but I do think we have to do something about it. Um, I guess um, I'm not quite as gloomy as Bob Gordon manages to be, but um, I, I do think that um, a calculation that, that a, a calculation that I made, that I asked Bob Gordon to make for me, uh, what was to uh, just calculate the uh, mean growth rate of total factor productivity. You probably know what that means. It's like a, the productivity of a basket of capital and labor, not just the productivity of labor or productivity of capital. Uh, uh, the, you, if you calculate that between 1972 and 2012, a 50-year period, uh, it's uh, the the it's it's around one percent per annum. Uh, that means that productivity, total factor productivity, doubles in 72 years. But that feels almost like standing still compared to what we had in the earlier period, uh, 1922 to 1972, uh, another 50-year period. In that period, uh, uh, the uh, trend rate of growth, uh, or the mean rate of growth of uh, total factor productivity was about 2% per annum. So uh, total factor productivity doubles every 36 years at that rate. And I think you can really uh, feel that. And, and, and I think that this, uh, that this means that, uh, that uh, so everybody's sort of touched by innovation. Right. Everybody's a little bit involved in innovation. It's much more of a grassroots uh, thing. Uh, so, so I don't see any reason to think that we're going to get out of this uh, 1% lock. Uh, I forgot to say that there was a nice period of eight years during the build out of the internet uh, in which productivity growth, in which, producti in which total factor productivity grew much faster. But at the end of that, but as the uh, build out of the internet neared completion, that slowed down and, went, and, and the growth rate went, went right back to 1%. So un unless we have some sort of a uh, um, an innovation boom coming up, and I don't see that on the horizon, I don't think there's any uh, reason to think that we're uh, that 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 we have the prospect for faster productivity growth than than we've had in in uh, recent recent years. Yeah. Well, I'm not I'm not sure. First of all, we we don't usually see innovation booms coming. We, we can look back, oh, yeah. and, and so we don't. Sure. Turning points are really hard in productivity. The good period you mentioned is the period where first electrification is the really big sort of general purpose technology, if you will, uh, and then the beginnings of computerization, um, automation, and the internet. But as I look today, I, I see the energy sector as ripe for enormous productivity improvements, uh, healthcare uh, as well. So I'm, I'm not sure that I would necessarily be trapped in, although I agree, I agree that it's, it's certainly a worry. You know, if you ask me to name what's the next general <coughs> purpose technology, I, I, I can't, and I don't think any economist can, but I wouldn't rule out that we're going to see it. Oh, I, no, I didn't mean to rule it out. And, and um, I, I wouldn't rule out something like the internet. I don't know whether we'd call that, a, maybe we would call it a general purpose technology. Uh, <coughs> but. Um, you know, it's been 50 years now, and we had only one, one um, little uh, period in which uh, productivity was much better, and so I, I, I don't I just don't, yeah, sure. In the next 50 years, we'll probably have something like the internet boom, but that's not a reason to think that the uh, that the trend growth rate uh, will, will be better than 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 one percent, uh, Glenn. You haven't uh, talked much about Europe, and I'd like to hear your views on Europe. Um, as I was commenting before, uh, Europe uh, went into, um, Europe seemed to lose its dynamism. It seemed to lose its innovation. In some cases, in the case of Britain and Germany, 
right after the war. And then uh, France held on for a bit longer, maybe in part because France was uh, later to the party. Um, and and uh, Italy, um, in Italy, I don't think uh, fast productivity growth uh, lasted beyond the uh, 60s. Do you, do you have any thoughts of wh what's your analysis of that? Well, I think there, there are a lot of contributing factors, Ned. One is, of course, the rise in social spending uh, in Europe, crowding out uh, other forms of spending and, and raising taxes. The bigger problem, in my view, is to do with labor market institutions that have not, to use your term, which I think is apt, rewarded work uh, and inclusion in the labor force. And I think you have two sapping forces. One, the sapping of innovation from draining the returns from that innovation, but then the other is sapping the willingness of people to participate uh, meaningfully in, in the economy. And I think both of those factors occurred in Europe. And I think for a long time, Europeans could cover that up because still in, in an affluent society where competitive walls are closed, you can still generate enough income to fund that. But what happens when the world becomes more competitive and that mm -hmm. social spending level becomes too high, mm -hmm. then these problems become acute. And I think that's, that's what we've seen. Of course, of course the uh, social spending hadn't, done, hadn't did, didn't do much between 1945 and and Correct. 1960, so, um, so I'm a little skeptical. That, I, for, for sure, all that so, social spending isn't helpful. I, right. I, I agree with it. Uh, and and um, for sure, uh, fiscal profligacy isn't, isn't uh, helpful uh, either. But, um, it, it seems to me that um, the, the European economies were kind of dead on arrival sometime after World War II. A and um, all they did in, in, by way of bad economic policies simply dug the hole deeper, but I don't think it, it really, really explains. Uh, it, it, it's, it's hard to argue that, that, that that's the main or sole no, but there are a variety of policies beyond the budget that are very important. <coughs> Labor market restrictions, restrictions on the size of markets in economies. So if you think about the scale of businesses in the U.S. for many years until it was much more of a common market, the allowed scale for businesses just wasn't that big. And so you couldn't really get the efficiency gains, the productivity gains that you could get in a larger economy. That's sort of the, mm -hmm. I mentioned the Smithian intuition that scale matters so much that was just not on the table for some time. Now, in the later years, yes, but not in the early years you mentioned. Right. Uh, talk, talk to us a little about regulation. Do you think that a lot of businesses, a lot of business people talk as if that's the, the main thing that's uh, holding them back from, uh, from doing their thing? Uh, well, what's your what's your view on regulation? It should be somewhat different for many business people. I, I'm very worried about uh, uncertainty in public policy. I think it's very difficult for business people who plan uh, long-term um, building decisions or hiring employees to commit when policy is uncertain. I'm not sure about regulation per se. And in fact, you know, I'm I tend to be I'm not one of these people who believes regulation comes from optimal policy. I believe it comes from political economy and. I think business groups and other groups use the state in a constant battle uh, to, to redistribute resources. And I think much of the current increase in regulation actually benefits some very large firms. Because small firms have a hard time paying the cost of complying with regulation. So I'm yeah. not sure that it's regulation per se that's necessarily what large firms are anxiety ridden about. But I do think it is this uncertainty. Uh, about where it's heading, whether the it is tax policy, health care policy, the implementation of Dodd-Frank, that kind of uncertainty, I think, is, is chilling. What would you think about breaking up the, um, the big companies that become so entrenched thanks to uh, regulatory carve-outs and regulations themselves, as you, as you just pointed out? Well, you know, I think 
in general, the market takes care of them. And if you looked at the um, carnage of large slumbering companies that just met their death from, from inefficiency, it's there where bigger companies have tended to survive is with much more explicit state support or guarantees. So the financial services sector certainly comes to mind there. And to me, the, the bigger issue is more um, making sure that no institution is, is uh, free from fail. And if we do that, then I guess I'm less worried that we need to go around breaking up. Because at least from where I sit, I don't know what the optimal size of a steel company or a bank or anything else is. I'd rather let the market figure that out, as long as the state isn't somehow on the other side. So if we had a good gov government policy in this regard, then of course you wouldn't. You wouldn't the market would just what? figure no, out. No, yeah. Big but uh, uh, my, guess, my question, I guess, supposed that uh, the government wouldn't be very good or would, wouldn't be able to uh, get rid of the whole fabric of regulations and that maybe. Well, I, I would agree with that, but I think, again, if you just, let's take the area where this is probably most salient, which is large financial institutions. Um, if we could credibly commit to no too big to fail, which means a real resolution mechanism, then I guess I'd be a little bit less worried. My fear about breaking up institutions is what problem are you trying to solve? So in the 30s, the bank failures were small. There was a lot of correlated risks among small banks, so just taking two or three big banks and making them into 50 smaller banks, I don't think that really makes the system safer. So what I'd rather do is make sure that business people are making private decisions, understanding risk as well as return, and not thinking taxpayers are always going to be on the other side bailing them out. So your feeling is that entry, uh, freedom of entry, is still in pretty good shape in the American economy? I think in general it is. Again, in, Financial institutions, I'm worried, simply because the regulatory burdens have created an entry barrier. So certainly if I were running a big incumbent financial institution, I think I might see some benefit, as well as some cost in some of these regulations. I wouldn't see the uncertainties beneficial, but the level of regulation might well be. Right. Um, last question. Um, do you have any thoughts about short-termism? I looked in the index to see whether I could find it in the index, and it, I didn't. Uh, you didn't. You don't. You don't discuss it. Well, if you mean by that, are, are um, U.S. business leaders too short term? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I I guess I'm skeptical that capital market pressures in the U.S. necessarily make business leaders uh, short term. At least my own experience in in corporate boards is that. You know, CEOs obviously care about analysts and shareholders, but they really are trying to look at the long-term value for the company. And frankly, even, quote, short-term investors are providing a very important discipline function in capital markets. So I guess the question would be relative to what? And if the alternative were, um, you know, slumbering investors who just didn't bother me, well, I could see that leading to lethargy. So I guess if there were a different, <coughs> I'm not sure what the counterfactual. I, I, I was thinking. Is. I was thinking of uh, financial companies that uh, put pressure, either explicitly or implicitly, on on businesses to hit quarterly earnings targets, rather than to think uh, long term. Not sure that this makes any sense, no, but that's no, part I mean, of it. That certainly happens, but I think you know a number of s companies and CEOs have moved away from even giving explicit guidance uh, on that and have tried to you know really say, here's our, our long-term targets and really work with large institutional <coughs> investors on that. That's not every institutional investor's cup of tea, but I guess I'm a little bit less, less worried there. I just, can I just comment on that, because yeah. I have some personal experience in that area, of course, that uh, it, people find it difficult not to give some guidance because you end up with a lot of volatility, and that's the problem. The analysts right. go off in different directions, so you tend to want to give some range or some guidance that's so that keep people aligned. Uh, the other thing is, I think for the longer term versus the shorter term, there is pressure. But when you the, you're not going to sacrifice major investments for the the, uh, the longer term, um, and, and and to to make a number uh, because you most CEOs are in place for six or seven years. 
you know, you really want to have the business in good shape so you can benefit from that as a CEO. So there's some limitation on the, 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 the way you, and, and willingness to push back on short-term pressures. Right. And actually to your point, you, know, you could change, it'd be a, a governance change, but you could tie compensation to payout over a much longer period yeah. of time. So yeah. as an executive, I would realize if I took a decision right. today that were adverse to the company five years from now, that's gonna hit me. So I mean, I think there are ways right. of accentuating what you're saying. By a lot of the long-term compensation cha changing will pick that up. the period over which the senior right. management is paid. Exactly. On the other hand, on the other hand, if my if my compensation is going to be tied to how the company uh, is doing, uh, so let's, let's say ten years out, uh, that may make me as the CEO uh, even less willing to bet the ranch. Yeah, that, that, that's an important point because I think the real longer term stuff for a large enterprise, it's hard to do the, the high risk investments, almost, on to, almost venture capital type investments internally right. because you have to suffer that through your I&E &E, and the benefit is so far out, sometimes right. you can't even see it. That I think is a real long term problem. Right. But not the interim stuff that's, say, feeding the, the, the market to come up with a product to be to, uh, introduced in three, four years, five years. I think the model right, works right, there. Right. Well, um, so what, so does, it, what does it take for mass flourishing? <laughs> to tell these folks. Oh, Glenn, that's the hardest question. Uh, it takes, well, but I can answer it at a, at a, at a, at a certain level. I, my answer at a certain level. It's, 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 um, it's about it's not it's about dynamism. Uh, you want to for for a sense of flourishing among ordinary people. I think you need to have the whole economy very much attuned to to innovating, and you want you want uh, companies to be structured in such a way that even people down the down the organizational ladder. Have some voice and have some involvement in, in uh, innovating. Uh, and if you have that, then uh, the business experience is uh, very rewarding, and um, and possibly exciting. And um, <clears throat> so that. Uh, a whole lot of people, maybe, 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 certainly not everybody, but a whole lot of people, uh, can be said to be flourishing, can be experiencing personal growth, and 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 um, having a lot of uh, excitement and intellectual stimulation um, in the process. Now the question is, how do you get this um, dynamism? Did we ever have it? Um, there's a fascinating quote that uh, came to my attention uh, a little late. I was within just a few days of uh, having the book snatched from my, from my hands. But it came from Abraham Lincoln. He was giving uh, what is called his second lecture, his second public lecture. It was called a lecture on discovery, invention, and something or other. Uh, turns out it wasn't the second lecture. It was the only lecture he'd ever given, so it was actually the first lecture. But in this second lecture, uh, <clears throat> he's talking about what society feels like to him today, at, at that time, in 1858, and he marvels at how turned on people are by all the, the novelty that's coming out. Now, obviously, he was thinking about consumers, but of course those are the same people who are going to work in companies, and if and if they're excited as consumers, probably they were also having, uh, being very engaged by the processes that produce the new products and the new methods. And uh, what was particularly striking was his his the way he summed this up. He said, "Why in America?" There's a perfect rage. No, a uh, sorry, I didn't get it right. There's a uh, 
There is a perfect passion, a rage for the new. And uh, I think that probably that period and, and um, several decades after it uh, marked a, a high, a high it was a high water mark for flourishing in America. And um, that's, that's my goal, to get back to that. It may not be possible because you, you can't squeeze turn, uh, blood from a stone and uh, maybe innovation possibilities uh, just are not as great as, as they once were at the present time. But I, I still think that there's room for a tremendous increase in the uh, dynamism of, of the economy. I couldn't agree more. I threw out two things from Lincoln for all of you. If you want to go, go read up on your Lincoln. My, my favorite Lincoln exploration and entrepreneurship, I, I like the one you mentioned, but I have one I like even better, where Lincoln tells a story of why was it that the steam engine we think of as being a modern innovation, why don't we go back and look at the one that Hero of Alexandria had? And Lincoln said, how curious, I'm not getting his words exactly right, but how curious that it was treated as a toy rather than by people who thought of its commercial applicability. And he was saying in the US, people wouldn't have made that mistake. And he, he said this as a powerful P into business. Another thing about Lincoln that's interesting we often say in this country today that we can't do big things. We had a financial crisis, we're indebted. Lincoln in the middle of the Civil War did transcontinental railroads, land grant colleges, the Homestead Act, all passed with a skeptical Congress. So he's somebody to go back and take a look at on, on dynamism. Lincoln is our guy. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're going to go to the audience now for questions, but I just have one question, Glenn, to kick it sure. off before we go. And so think of your question here for a minute. We have a, a, a politically divided uh, political system right now, right? And it, 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 you can argue a couple of ways. Number one, maybe the extremes are producing new ideas, or the extremes are blocking us from making good decisions about where we need to go. How do you see it, the, 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 the current political polarization that we have? Well, you know what's interesting? We were just talking about Lincoln. If you look at American history, there's lots of periods of polarization. So this idea that we've never had politicians hating each other, that's, that's not really true. I, I think it does point, though, to the need to make sure you have competition for ideas. One of the things Tim and I talk about in the book is something else went off the rails since 1970. It wasn't just social spending. There were changes um, that were billed as good government in our political system that effectively gave the Democrat and Republican parties monopolies over fundraising. Campaign finance reform, a whole series of those really monopolized the control of money into politics, and I think it, it was chilling. And I think if we had a more open political system, yeah, there are gonna be some nutty ideas, just like somebody opens up a hamburger store that doesn't work, but somebody else opens what, one that does. And so I, I'm optimistic we can restore that political competition. And I'm willing to put up with the nutcases along, <laughs> along the way. 